Welcome to the Deeper Dive podcast brought to you by the OC Church of Christ. Let's dive deep into God's word, learning new insight and taking a fresh look at the verses that impact our daily lives. We will continue with our study of the Minor Prophets by doing part two of the book of Hosea. Here is John Oaks. Last week, we did a lesson from Hosea chapter one through three. And the title was The Unrelenting Love of God. We saw that in Hosea, God uses two very powerful metaphors to explain himself to us. The first metaphor and our relationship. first metaphor was the relationship between a very faithful husband and an unfaithful wife. And the amazing thing is God uses Hosea to act out this metaphor which is a pretty tough assignment, correct? The second metaphor is that of a loving parent for his or her child. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to be in Hosea 11, 1 through 12, 6. So in Hosea 1, verse 2, God says to Hosea, go and marry an adulterous wife, an adulterous woman, and even accept the children of her adultery into your family. Now, why would God ask Hosea to do that? Because in this story, Hosea is God and Gomer, his wife, is us. It's Israel in the context, but it's us. And why would God ask Hosea to do that? Because that is what God did. God chose us even though he knew that we would be unfaithful to him. It's a powerful story. And so uh, they get married and Gomer gives birth to a son. His name is Jezreel, which means vengeance. Then he gives birth, then, then Gomer gives birth to a daughter that's probably not even Hosea's child. And the name of the daughter is Lo Rahama, not loved. Because of their sin, vengeance is coming. Because of our sin, we were not. It's not that God didn't love us, but we weren't the recipients of that. We weren't experiencing that love. Then he had another son, and the name was Loami. And Loami means no mercy. And that was the situation we had. Outside of Christ, there was no mercy. Not that God is not a merciful God. Far from it. But God's holiness and his righteousness is as powerful as his love. So, in chapter 2, Hosea is talking to his children. He says to his children, go talk to your mother and tell her she's been unfaithful to me and she's no longer my wife. And we too, because of our sin, we were unfaithful to God. We didn't practice has said faithful love and we lost that relationship with God. And that was Israel, that was us. And then in verse 9, he says, take away everything she values. Take away the thing she was counting on because God's hoping that she will come to her senses. And she did. And he says in verse 13, I will punish her for her adultery. Not because I hate her, but because I love her. Trying to call her back. And then chapter 2, verse 14, where basically God you know, dresses up and he goes and brings back his children. God wooed us. Even while we were sinners, Christ loved us. That's God's unrelenting love. And at the end of chapter two, he says, Lo Ruhama has become Ruhama. Not my people has become my people. And Lo Ami, not love, will become love. And then, of course, as with God, so with Hosea. So in chapter 3, God says to Hosea, show your love to your wife again. And he went to her. There's children here. We'll say her, the, the guy, you know, that, I don't want to use that word. They'll ask you about the meaning of that word. All right, you got it? And he buys her back. He pays, he pays the price of a slave. And he literally buys her back which is what God did. But the price at which God brought us back 
is a lot more than 30 shekels of silver, is it not? All right, so now let's let's read a trans- transition verse, Hosea 6.6, 6, and then we'll get into our passage for the morning. Hosea 6.6. 6. Hosea, right after Daniel. Hosea 6.6. 6. I don't know, I just couldn't skip this one. I had to stop here because we saw this one at least twice in the book of Matthew. It says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And that is God's appeal to us, is he wants mercy, not sacrifice. Um, it, this is quoted in Matthew 9.13. And that's how Jesus treated the woman caught in adultery. Mercy, not sacrifice. Yes, we're going to call people to holiness. We're going to call people to obedience. We will never back down. Did Jesus back down with the woman in adultery? Not at all. Not one bit. But the, but the posture to everyone is mercy first. So let's get to our passage. Hosea 11, and I'm going to read verse 1 through 4. How are you all doing this morning? You warming up? Maybe, maybe if Paul's lucky, he can take off his little hat thing. I, I told him it looks like he's got a burqa on. All right. It, you know, amen. All right. Got a little bit of wind. I got pages. I got wind. I got a Bible. All right. We'll do our best here. Hosea 11, 1 through 4. Again, this is that second metaphor. Remember the first metaphor? Faithful husband, unfaithful wife. Second metaphor is loving parent. And small child. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals. They burnt incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. Taking them by their arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with the cords of human kindness, with ties of love. And again, I want you to get the picture of a, of a father or mother. It, it, this is kind of a genderless description here of a parent leading their child. And the child was you and me. The child was Israel. It, it's a beautiful picture. We were helpless children, but God called us out of Egypt. And in your life spiritually, you were helpless. You had no hope. You were not loved. You were not a people. But God called you out of Egypt. Now, this, this, Hosea is remembering, reminding them of deeply held history to them. Think about those moments that you'll never forget. Those of you who are old, you'll never forget November 21st, 1963. All right? You'll never forget what you, where you were and what you were doing. Because that was the day that John F. Kennedy was shot. All right, looking back, will you ever forget the year 2020? No. Yeah, for, for the rest of your life, when they say 2020, you go, oh, yeah, 2020. Right, now, are you going to remember uh, 2014? I, I guess. What happened in 2014? Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I can't. Re- 2020. So when he says, out of Egypt, I called my son. He's like saying, do you remember? Oh, yes, they remember. Or maybe for you, it'd be September 11th, 2001. Because they had been slaves in Egypt. They were not a people. They hadn't received mercy. And in Egypt, you could not worship God. If you read in Exodus, uh, M- Moses says to Pharaoh, I need, we need to leave and go into the desert so that we can worship God. Because as long as you were enslaved to sin, you could not have that relationship with God. But God loved them as a parent loves a child. Another similar description is in Ezekiel 16. Verse 1 through 11. 
And as I read this one, I'm going to have to tone it down a little bit also. Ezekiel 16, again, this is a description of how God loved us when we were not terrifically lovable. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, confront Jerusalem with their detestable practices and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. <clears throat> your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. That, by the way, that's not a compliment. All right. That is not a compliment. You were not my people. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt. I guess they rubbed babies with salt back then. <laughs> or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Not a people, no mercy. Then I passed by and I saw you kicking about in your blood, this baby. And you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant in the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. I think I can say that one. You're, you're, uh, all right. You had formed, your hair was grown, you were moving on. Later I passed by and I looked at you and I saw that you were old enough for love. I spread the corner of my garment over you and I covered your body. I gave you my oath and I entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water. I washed the blood from you. I put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress. I put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and I covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. God loved us. So he called us out of Egypt. Matthew quotes this passage in Matthew 2, 14 and 15 because Jesus went down to Egypt with his parents. God called us out of Egypt. God called Joseph out of Egypt in Joshua 24, 32. As he's dying, Joshua reminds them, when I die, take my bones from Egypt and take them back to the promised land. God called Moses out of Egypt, even though he was living in the palace, the adopted son of the king. He will, willingly became a slave to live amongst the slaves, as did Jesus. And God called Moses out of Egypt. God called Israel out of Egypt. That's what he's referring to here. He's reminding them that he called them out of Egypt into a relationship with him. And then, of course, God called his son, right? Out of Egypt, I called my son. And that is Jesus. Jesus who came here also to live amongst the slaves so that he could save the slaves. And God called Jesus out of Egypt. And last of all, God called you and me. We were the, the child still in the blood without clothing, without a blanket. And God called us out of Egypt. But unfortunately, what did we do in verse 2? It says, the more they were called, the more they went away from me. By the way, that's not what the Hebrew says, all right? I'm going to tell you what the Hebrew says. That, that's kind of close. It's not what it says. So I want you to give the sense, get the sense of what he's, God's saying here. Uh, literally... I'm going to say this slowly so you can follow me. They, Israel, called to them Egypt. That is how they, Israel, left Egypt. That's what it actually says. They, Israel, called them Egypt. That is how they, Israel, left Egypt. In other words, even as they were leaving Egypt, they were already looking back at Egypt. I hope that's not you. But I know it's me at times. You know, God loved us as a child. He cared, held us to his cheek. He led us by the hand. But even as God called us out of Egypt, 
we had already begun to look back at Egypt. And that made God very sad. Very sad. And it says that they sacrificed to the Baals. And, you know, the Baal is that's represented by a, a calf or a cow or a bull. And even on Mount Sinai, they were already making that golden calf. What might that golden calf be for you? It is not a good thing, whatever it is. Maybe that golden calf, maybe that bail would be a career, a relationship, your hobby, your time in nature, leisure, whatever it is. Generally, that golden calf, that bail, is not even a sinful thing. But you look to it for a relationship rather than to God. But God, all along, as, as we read here, He was taking us in by His arms. It says, but they didn't realize it. We forgot how God loved us. How He carried us. It says, He led them with the cords of human kindness. God was kind to us. He was gentle to us. And it's, it's like he lifted a child to his cheek. That's how God was towards us. The, with the affection of a parent for a child. I hope you feel that. I hope you understand that he, he lifted up to his cheek and he bent down to feed us. He fed them with manna in the wilderness. And God is feeding you. He's trying to feed you with the scriptures. I hope you guys had a quiet time this week, like every day. If you miss one, it's okay. But God has been feeding you and holding you. As we learn in Isaiah chapter 1 through 3, it's like this, but that, you know. But, verse 5 through 7, unfortunately... Sometimes we didn't understand that. We forgot how God loved us. Verse 5. Will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets. It will put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God most high, I will by no means exalt them. And may this never be in your case. God says, because they return to idolatry, I will send them back to Egypt. Now he says, they will, will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them? Which was it? Well, it was Assyria. Because although the first time they went into captivity, it was in Egypt. But in 722 BC, like we learned last week, because of their sin... The Assyrian Empire came, and Ashurbanipal, and Samaria was destroyed, and they were taken back into captivity, captivity in Assyria. And they ended up slaves again. You know, God's affectionate parent-like love does not preclude judgment. The fact that God loved you enough to save you does not mean you couldn't lose that salvation. It doesn't mean that. And in verse 7, they worship me. They say, God most high. They're still religious. They're still going to church. But God says, I ain't exalting them. Uh-uh. I'm not going to exalt them because of their idolatry and their slavery. Okay, let's read on. So, good news, bad news. Oh, good news again, though. <laughs> good news again. I love Hosea 11, uh, 8 through 11. We just feel this emotion. We feel the emotion of God. Because even as we're coming out of Egypt, we're looking back at Egypt. And God knows that the result of His justice is, okay, 
You just go back to Egypt then. But listen to this. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. My compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. God's judgment says, you guys are toast. I'm toast. But God says, how can I give them up? Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I long to gather you in as a hen gathers in your chicks. But you would not have me. He says, how can I treat you like Adma and Zeboim? Now I'm guessing probably none of you know, except Joelle, because she took our modern prophets class, she knows. Zeboim and Adma? Well, it's like this. Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim, Adma, and Zeboim. So why didn't he just say Sodom and Gomorrah? Because it gave me a chance to, you know, catch your attention. He's kind of being poetic here. Because his audience, unlike us, they knew who Adma and Zeboim were, all right? They paid attention. So he's saying, and so what did he do to Sodom and Gomorrah? He just handed them over, toast. He says, he said, "I, I can't do that to my people. I just can't do it. How can I treat them as my judgment requires? He says, I I just, I can't do that. He says, a loving God cannot carry out his wrath like this. I just can't. He says, my compassion is aroused as a parent. Those of us who are parents, we know exactly what he's talking about. We can't give up on our children. We just can't. And yet there's times when we have to discipline them. Are there not? Oh, yeah. And it says in verse 9, I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim. Why? Because I am God and not a man. And I I can do what I want. All right. And it's it's sort of cool. I, I don't think I read verse 10 and 11. Did I? I don't, I don't think I, I was supposed to. It said it in my notes. Oh, I did? Well, whatever. I'll read them again. Then they will follow the, the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt, trembling like sparrows. From Assyria, fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes. So God will call us back out of Egypt a second time. Hoping. And, you know, sometimes Jesus is described as a lamb. And sometimes he's described as a lion. But in this case, he's a lion and he's roaring and he's going to go after Babylon. He's going to destroy Assyria and God's people are going to come back. By the way, this is this is what happened. (laughs) It's called the restoration. In 536 B.C., God destroyed Babylon and the people began to come back. They come back. Some of them literally came back from Egypt. Others of them came back from Assyria because God cannot give us up. He won't give us up. But if we choose, he will abandon us in Egypt or in Assyria if we won't come back to him. That's just the reality of the situation. Let's read Hosea 11, 12, 11, 12 through chapter 12, verse 2. Bad news again. But then we'll end with good news. It's good, bad, good, bad, good. That's our outline today. All right, got it? Hosea eleven twelve through chapter 12, verse 2. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, Israel with deceit, and Judah, even Judah, is unruly against God, even against the faithful one, faithful holy one. Ephraim feeds on the wind. By the way, earlier in chapter 8, verse 8, he says, those who... Sow to the wind, reap the whirlwind. He says that in Hosea chapter 8. The Lord is a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob 
according to his ways. When it says Jacob, Jacob is the other name of Israel. So he says, I'm going to punish the northern kingdom. And yes, even the southern kingdom. At this time, the southern kingdom, Judah, was still being fairly faithful. But God says, eventually, even Judah will fall. He says, Ephraim has lied and Judah has been unfaithful. Why? Because they make treaties with Egypt and Assyria. If you're involved in our Isaiah class, and you should come Sunday mornings. All right, and and, and next Sunday we're going to learn about how Ahaz went after Egypt. And and then the, the kings of Israel and Judah, they were constantly seeking treaties with other worldly powers in order to take care of them. And God says, don't do that. Do not sign treaties with those people. Have you signed any treaties with the world? I hope you have not. I hope you've not gone down to Assyria or in Egypt for help instead of God. You signed a treaty. You said, let me pursue this degree. Then when I'm done, then I'll start going to church. Well, you didn't say that because you're here. But, you know, maybe somebody did. Or you'll say, you know, I'm going to take this job on Sunday because I need to come up with enough money to pay my bills. I need the money. Surely God will understand. Yeah, God understands. And he's going to make you like Adma and Zeboiim. I will live where there's no active church to be near because I got to take care of my family and I need that job. Do not make treaties with Egypt and Assyria. That's a very bad mistake. Let's finish out. We're going to read uh, chapter 12, verse 3 through 6. And so he's going to kind of shift his metaphor a little bit because now Jacob is going to become the actual person, Jacob. So in verse 2, Jacob is the northern kingdom that's been unfaithful. So he's going to do a little switcheroo on you here. So you got to follow along. In the womb, he grasped his brother's heel. Uh, In verse two, when he's talking about Jacob, he's talking about, you know, Israel being unfaithful. And then he kind of he's playing a trick with you here. It's like now he's talking about the actual guy, Jacob, you know, the one whose brother was Esau. That's what he's doing to you here. So uh, in the womb, he grasped his brother's heel as a man. He struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and he overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and he talked with him there. The Lord Almighty, the Lord is his name. But you must return to your God, maintain love and justice and wait for your God always. So he's again explaining this thing of being unfaithful but then out of Egypt to call my son and he talks about this guy Jacob Jacob when he was young he was not very spiritual you know he was fighting with his brother even as he was coming out of the womb he's grabbing his brother Esau's heel that's the word Jacob means heel grabber and so he was fighting against God he was fighting. That's Genesis 25, 24 through 26. And he was fighting God's will for his life. But you know what? In verse 4, Jacob changed. When Jacob was a youth, he was fighting against where God was trying to take him. But later on, you know, he was struggling. He was struggling to have a relationship with God. This happened at Beth El. You can read about it in Genesis 32, 22 through 32. The one with the, you know, the, the, the ladder, Jacob's ladder. And Jacob had gone from somebody who was not seeking after God to somebody who was earnestly seeking for God. And he wrestled with God. He says, with the angel, but he says, give me that blessing. So Jacob is an example of a person who started out not so good. Not seeking God. But Jacob is a story of Israel. Oh, because that's because Jacob is Israel, right? And Israel means struggle with God. So when he was young, he struggled against God. That was all of us, I think. But then later on in his life, he struggled to know God. 
And that is a great example. So God is hoping that we will be Jacob number two. All right? And he found him because he struggled. He tried with all his energy to find and to know God. God all along was the parent who was reaching out his hand, who was holding to his cheek, calling with the cords of human kindness. So what's the end of the matter? The end of the matter is Hosea 12, verse 6. And God is saying to you, wherever you are this morning or this afternoon, if you're online, wherever you are, God is saying this to you. You must return to your God. To the extent that you've been looking back to Egypt. And if you haven't been looking back to Egypt, amen for that. Amen for that. But if you have been, he says, you must return to your God. And you must maintain love and justice. Mercy has said, faithful love. You must maintain justice and love. And we need to wait for God. We need to not be like these people. Instead of hoping in God, they made treaties with the world. No, the only treaty we need to have is the one where we say, total surrender, Luke 14. And we become a disciple. So God wants us to maintain that faithful covenant relationship with him. He wants us to show justice in this world. To show up on April 3rd to feed the homeless or whatever version of that you do. So God says, always wait on me. The one who called you out of Egypt like a father calls his son. The one whose compassion is aroused so he does not treat us like Adma and Zeboeum. The one who will respond if we zealously seek his blessing, as did Jacob. Out of Egypt, the loving, compassionate, affectionate God is calling his son and his daughter. Will you come today? Thank you. Thank you, John Oaks, and thank you all for listening to Deeper Dive by the OC Church of Christ. If you want to get connected to us or want to donate to the program, go to our website, occhurchofchrist.com, or through social media at the OC Church. Join us next time as we continue our Deeper Dive into the Minor Prophets.